Hello, everyone. As Ollie just mentioned, my name is Jacob Steinley. I'm a junior studying biochemistry with the hopes of attending medical school. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for the evening, Fred Heeren. Mr. Heeren is a science journalist and the founder of Daystar Research. He has written for the New York Times, Boston Globe, Wall Street Journal, Nature, and countless other publications. Also, his work has been featured in college textbooks. He specializes in Big Bang cosmology during his first decade of science writing and frequently speaks about the Big Bang, the history of the universe, the evolution of dinosaurs, and humans, and the relationship, or lack thereof, between science and faith. His research has taken him to Africa, Asia, Europe, and South America to, discover, to cover discoveries in both dinosaur and hominoid evolution. Tonight's presentation is titled, Hydrogen to Humans, Scientific Discoveries that Fill in Our Evolutionary History. Please welcome Fred here into the stage. Good evening. So we're here to talk tonight about how the universe went from hydrogen to humans. And we're going to look at some of the key discoveries that fill in that timeline and try to get a better handle on how science works and uh, try to do so while we're also getting a better handle on why it took so long for us to get it working. Big hint that has to do with whether we start out trying to prove something or trying to investigate something. We journalists appreciate good investigation I'm a nosy person by nature. My uh, last girlfriend said that I'm too nosy. At least that's what it said in her diary. <laughs> Humans are curious beings uh, with questions about everything. Problem is we're too easily satisfied with whatever answers we can get about our world, whether those answers are correct or not. Humans need science to get correct answers. And we're about to see why getting correct answers matters. Next Saturday, I'll be speaking at March for Science, and the goal there is to get people raising their voices for science because we want science to be championed, not chopped. We want it to be understood, not undermined. Cuddled, not cut. We want science literacy, not pseudoscience lunacy. Well, it's a great day for the race. I'm thinking of the human race. We humans in this particular snapshot of geological history belong to a generation that lives in a special time on this planet. In this respect, if we're looking back um, four and a half billion years since the Earth's formation, plus about seven and a half billion years to go till the time that the sun's expanding surface reaches Earth's orbit, that's 12 billion years, we live about two-fifths of the way through the once and future history of planet Earth, possibly about halfway through the period of Earth's habitability. But that's not what makes this um, particular generation we live in special, that just gives you some scale. What makes this tiny slice of geological history out of all those billions of years special is this is the generation when a species on this planet became aware of how it got here and became aware of its own unique role to become either the defender of life on Earth or its destroyer. This is the generation we became, or are becoming, woke because of science. However it happened, why ever it happened, our relatively defenseless, clawless, tiny-toothed species became not just the top of the food chain, we became, in just this past generation, both capable of wiping out most of life on Earth in a matter of a few years through nuclear winter, or killing off the majority of the world's species through an extin extinction event of our own making, or we can act on our sudden and growing awareness of the natural balancing acts that our world is performing, each species adapting to every niche and to their surrounding species, and the ways our planet keeps its biome balanced for many millions of years running via the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, via the hot radioactive magnetic core of our planet that produces plate tectonics, and recycles our continental crust to keep our eroding continents above water for many millions of years, and that generates a magnetosphere that protects life from radiation, and that creates a carbon cycle that serves as a global thermostat to keep our planet full of oceans that don't evaporate away, that keeps us from experiencing a runaway greenhouse effect as on Venus, or a runaway freeze as on Mars. But with all this awareness comes something that science alone can't measure, and that's responsibility. 
Now, some may doubt that those scientists actually know what they're talking about, and some do doubt. The right to be skeptical, it's good to be skeptical. So we can start with our doubting friends by complimenting them on their skepticism, because when you think about it, if you hadn't heard the story of the universe before, and someone suddenly told it to you, it'd be pretty tough to believe. I mean, somehow you have to get from hydrogen all the way to humans, and everything that happens in between makes for an intriguing story, both because of the fact that it happened to produce life and consciousness, and because of this subset of our conscious species, called scientists, uh, actually figured it out, figured out each step quite recently, within this tiny instant, geologically speaking, since the rise of science, and mostly just in this last generation or two. If we were to picture this long timeline running across this stage, well, it's pretty unbelievable. I mean, just look at it. Big Bang, right over here, but all that would become what we see around us was squeezed within a point of energy millions of times smaller than a proton, then separation of nature's four fundamental forces, otherwise we wouldn't have gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and uh, uh, we wouldn't uh, have all the things that those produce in terms of holding things together um, on the large and small scales. The appearance of the Higgs field next that uh, Chris Rogan will talk about next hour so that things would have mass, then sudden exponential expansion of the universe called inflation, so the universe could become flat and homogeneous with temperatures the same in every direction, but with tiny ripples that were the precursors of stars and galaxies. Nucleosynthesis of hydrogen and helium, so that there could be these, this clumping together of uh, these nuclear furnaces called stars, which would later supply all our energy needs. But in them, the production of the heavy elements then happens, and the, the rest of the periodic table through star burning and supernovas. Otherwise, no carbon, no nitrogen, no oxygen, and all the heavy elements that at least our form of life depend upon. Then we have black holes, then we have galaxies, uh, planets, plate tectonics on some of them, providing all that we mentioned before in the way of a global thermostat and continents of stay above water and magnetic shield from lethal space radiation. We have origin of life, Cyanobacteria oxygenates the atmosphere, multicellular life, the evolution of the phyla craniates among them right away, uh, eventually beginnings of self-awareness in several vertebrate species, and we have out of Africa and multi-regional human mixing that both contribute to uh, modern homo sapiens. Uh, Neanderthal and other archaic homo species uh, go extinct, and homo sapiens goes on to develop agriculture, religions, cities, civilization, writing, science. And so all this builds up until finally at the very pinnacle we have atheists. Now I'm, I'm a Christian, but almost all my friends for the past eight years have been atheists. If I had to pick between a, a Christian and an atheist, if I was alone on a desert island with somebody these days, I think I'd, I'd pick the atheist because the Christian would just bore me to death. Uh, unless he was, unless it was a really big atheist, and he might, you know, eat too much, and we only had so many berries. I could have just as easily said the pinnacle, we have science journalists, it's all a matter of perspective. So, why are we finally finding out all this stuff just now, finally? The whole timeline, weren't, weren't humans just as intelligent a few thousand years ago? Why weren't they making big progress in science by the time you get to the Pharaoh's court in ancient Egypt, or in Sumer, or in Babylon? Didn't they have the curiosity? Did they lack the division of labor or the leisure class? I mean, they had professional star watchers. What were they doing? And at this point, it'd be very easy to make fun of faraway peoples from ancient times who can't defend themselves. So let's do that. Uh, let me try to illustrate the problem so you can, once again, imagine for yourself, picture a group of young Egyptian princes sitting in class, which we know they did, thinking they were running the universe from Memphis, which we know they did. Because this was during the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom, 26th century BCE, when kings began to declare themselves gods. At the death of kings, at death the kings would join the circumpolar stars that never set, the, the immortals, and they would become gods themselves, as long as their air shaft of the pyramid was, was aimed correctly. So they also had to learn how to precisely orient their pyramids with the stars. So picture these half-dozen half-brothers, sons of Khufu, builder of uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza, and among the brothers is Khafre, who would one day build the second Great Pyramid there. 
And uh, there they are sitting before their box desk, rifling through their sheets of papyrus to get the, ready for today's astronomy's lessons. And uh, while torch-bearing servants are closing in to help them see, and their priest teacher asks them their first question, what is the most important constellation that sails from east to west each night and then dies on the, on the western horizon? The correct answer would be Great Grandpa Huni, or Osiris, which is the same thing. Today we call the constellation uh, Orion. And then, uh, next question, and who is it that follows him each night and disappears beyond the horizon with him? And the royal brothers would answer in unison, his lover Sopdet, that bright star we now know as Sirius. Yes, says the teacher, so when we watch them from, when we watch them set earlier each night, they eventually disappear into the netherworld for how many days? Seventy. And how many days do we take to prepare the dead in the embalming house for the next life? Seventy. And what happens when we first see Sopdet again through the glare of the, the rising sun? And they could answer correctly either the new year, or the Nile begins to flood, or the dead marshes come alive again. And so the, uh, the lesson for the princes is Osiris and Sopdet having sex causes the Nile to flood and renews all of life. And any of these princes who would one day become king uh, would perform this duty. The Egyptians were right to correlate the reappearance of the bright star Sirius each year with the flooding of the Nile, but not to interpret uh, the star as the cause. The problem certainly wasn't that they were ignorant of what was happening in the skies or what was happening with the Nile's flooding. It was that they were drawing wrong conclusions about causation from these correlations. And they did that because it worked. They had knowledge about the facts, but they had no methods to help them correctly put the facts together. And all knowledge was received knowledge. Knowledge always came from the past. There was little reason to question the things that had given them power over all the commoners who they controlled, partly by their controlling the agricultural ca uh, calendar. The people needed the royalty and the priest to know when to plant, when to harvest. Children of the elite noble classes learned the same lessons by rote that their ancestors had learned 500 years before that. Now, in 1953 BCE, about 500 years after this little scene we just talked about, in the eastern sky, just before dawn, there was a unique conjunction of all five of the visible planets, the closest, most perfect massing together of the planets in the last 5,000 years. It's apparently what started the Chinese working on their calendar. And for Egypt, it was correlated with the time when the Nile floods began to return to their uh, levels where they needed to be at in order to have agriculture because they'd been having nothing for the 200 years before that. So from that time uh, all the way through the New Kingdom and down to uh, Greco-Roman times, the Egyptians ordered, they sequenced the planets according to their records of when each separated from that mass. First Jupiter, then Saturn, Mars, Mercury, and finally Venus. And that's the order we see them in in all their art for several thousand years after that point. Meanwhile, in ancient Sumer, the tradition of ordering the planets from fastest to slowest moving planets had begun, which eventually proved to be much more useful for understanding the planets in terms of their distance from us. But no one there, or as far as we know anywhere in the world, was picturing these wandering stars and constellations geometrically in, in terms of their physical correlations to one another relation to one another. They didn't picture the sun, moon, and planets as taking the form of a flat pancake, even though they saw them travel through the same swath of sky, what they called the path of the moon. And all they cared about was the timing of when a star would appear and when a conjunction would occur, because these were the things that indicated the interactions of the gods, and that's what influenced things on Earth, which eventually became very important for astrology. So it's not certain that science began in Sumer, but it's certain that something like it stagnated there, which is odd, considering that by the time the, the third dynasty of Ur reached its heyday, everything was in place to begin a new era of discovery. Remember, that's when they had writing first. That's when they had all this record keeping of the expanse above and actually modeling of the uh, animal interiors below. An observatory called the Great Ziggurat of Ur uh, actually had ziggurats in all the cities and staffs of sky readers dedicated to answering and answering what the king wanted to know about what this meant for them and understanding the movements of each heavenly object along this path of the moon. 
all the requisite human intelligence, certainly they had that, and they had plenty of motivation to decipher clues from nature that might improve the human lot, especially the king's human lot. So picture King Shulgi, greatest king of the Ur third period, about 2000 BC, dictating a hymn to himself and proclaiming himself the paragon of every human enterprise while his scribe presses the stylus into the clay trying to keep up and the King Shulgi proclaims himself the strongest warrior, the fastest runner, the finest musician, the best scribe, the best lover. He is after all a god. He himself confirmed it in his, the 23rd year of his reign. Life's renewal each spring depends critically upon the king's annual ritual sex with Inanna, the queen of heaven, who has brought all the arts and technologies of civilizations to humanity. Only gods or kings can give us new knowledge. So just a few lines from what is called translation B of his most famous hymn. So these are the actual words of Shulgi from 4,000 years ago. I am Shulgi, god of manliness, the foremost of the troops. Mortals gawk at my immense bodily strength. Do not my achievements surpass all? King of the four corners of the universe am I, God of all the lands, chosen for the vulva of Inanna am I. My words shall never be forgotten. Praise for me because of my reliable judgments on everyone's lips. The wise scribe of Nadaba am I, the most ritually pure interpreter of omens. In the insides of just one sheep, I, the king, can find the indications of everything and everywhere. And when I have discovered writings from ancient times, I have never declared them to be false and have never contradicted their contents. I have conserved these iniquities, antiquities, <laughs> antiquities. The, ac the academies are never to be altered and my words shall not fall into oblivion. This and only this is now my accumulated knowledge. Obviously, King Shulgi wasn't leaving much room for new knowledge, for discovery. Would-be scientists would be punished for straying from tradition while the king's schmoozers and yaysayers were rewarded. The Sumerian sexagesimal system, so suited to dividing land, skies, and time into degrees, minutes, seconds, would not be so applied for another 18 centuries. So let's move ahead another millennium and a half to see what kind of progress the Babylonians were making by then. The inscriptions of the Babylonians' last king, Nabonidus, proclaimed that he had become, quote, entrusted by Narnar, the moon god, with the moon, with the rule over all of mankind, unquote. He had received not only his name from Nabu, the god of wisdom and writing, but the wisdom required to establish his empire over all other empires. Knowledge seemed to have reached a pinnacle, and the world till then was never riper for a scientific exploit. But once again, knowledge was exploited mainly to exploit the commoners. And with that accomplished by king and priest, the need for new knowledge ceased. So picture King Nabonidus looking out over all his people sleeping on their rooftops, as anyone without air conditioning uh, still does today in Iraq. But picture the King Nabonidus standing on the shrine on the top story of the tallest building yet constructed in the east, the great ziggurat of Babylon safely within the massive double walls of his capital on June 13th, 539 BCE, four months before Babylon's fall to Cyrus, the Persian. And a, a partial eclipse of the moon begins. Now this is the kind of thing that gets the attention of a king whose god is the moon, whose lifelong preoccupation has been to replace Marduk with the moon god, Narnar, the god of his mother, where he grew up in foreign territory. And this was just the time when we know that some Babylonian sky watchers using the records of the Assyrians before them began to accurately predict lunar eclipses right down to the type and time. What would the king's conversation with one of his royal sky watchers have been like if the sky watcher had accurately predicted the eclipse and when the king called him to ask for its meaning, this astromancer was not a soothsayer trying to keep the king happy, but was completely honest about what he knew. What if the soothsayer was you? being an honest person who had this audience with the king as his royal astromancer. So picture yourself and the king on the parapet gazing out at the, the partially eclipsed moon, which was gradually being blacked out from left to right along the lower part of the moon. And uh, the king asks, how did you do it? Which god revealed this to you? And so you answer from your years of study, honestly, 
my king, my celestial events, many celestial events are periodic, like the phases of the moon, and so are lunar eclipses. So prediction is a matter of finding the cycles. By studying the records, I found one of the cycles that recurs every 18 years. To be precise, 18 years, 11 and a third days ago, there was a partial lunar eclipse, and I knew this one would replay the type. Partial, covering the bottom quarter, but a, a third of a day later because of the extra third of a day between cycles. The king's eyes are kind of glazing over, and he just wants to get to the meaning, so he says, okay, whatever, what does this omen portend? Because eclipses are almost always associated with bad things happening to important people. The question is, for who? And you're now thinking, my, my neck is on the line here. Why did I get into this profession? I've lost three of my colleagues when they couldn't give the king a good answer in just this kind of situation. And the king is thinking, the eclipse must have something to do with Cyrus the Persian, who is reported to be amassing a great army to the north, and they say he's already persuaded General Grobrius into betraying me and joining forces with the Persian army. So the, the king asks, so tell me, do I go out and meet Cyrus in battle, or do I wait for, it, wait for him to attack? What would you say, standing before the king of the four corners of the earth with your life on the line? You got to answer, so you say, my king, my king, I, I, think, I think that this is the question for your military advisors. And King Nabonidus starts to frown and says, so it is, but the question remains, which of them am I to believe? What do you do? You might look up at the eclipse moon, hoping that the king might follow your glance and return to thinking about your astronomical accomplishment. I mean, stalling's good, at least you have a plan. But the king wants to know if this eclipse is not some warning from the moon about, uh, from the moon god about Cyrus, then what is? What, what is the message? And there's no more putting it off, so you say, oh my king, and you bow with great respect, and you say, it seems to me, most likely, there is no message. And when you look up, the king's face is turning red like a baby. Its face is about to explode in a wail, and he, and he shouts out, Who gave you the message that there is no message? And you're being honest, so you have to tell him, My king, in my lifetime, from what I've observed, it's always a stretch to, to fit the heavenly signs with the floods and the pestilences. The sacred tablets tell us we should expect. What little correlation we find is no better than what we'd expect by chance. And the king says, Of what use is an omen without a meaning? And about that time, one of, the two, one of two things would happen. If you're lucky, another court soothsayer steps in and says, my fabulous Lord, we have not yet consulted the livers. And the, the king's attention is diverted for, for, from you to the other uh, more helpful diviners who might, uh, and you might live to see another day. Alternatively, you don't. Now, all this is to show what was missing what prevented science from taking off? Science started and stagnated in ancient Egypt, in Sumer, and Babylon, because the whole concept of an open scientific pursuit that included things like induction, explanatory power, parsimony, falsifi falsifiability, anybody using these methods would be misunderstood, and to the degree that it was understood, it would not be supported. And the same problematic thinking, the same lack of support, especially by the people in power, can slow down or even stop science today. Science, the way I see it, requires three things, a curious mind, a cultivated methodology, and, quite often, a crap load of money. When curiosity is discouraged or people are not aware of the importance of the scientific methods that have proved most effective for discovery uh, to keep us from fooling ourselves, or when science isn't financially supported, it stagnates. So when did real science finally begin? Was it when people started using empirical methods? Well, the ancient astromancers actually had empiricism at the center of their work. They were observing the skies, they had the livers, but something new was set in motion during the time of Nabonidus, as a matter of fact, not in his country, and, and discovery started to actually go somewhere, beginning with a sage from the Greek city of Miletus in modern-day Turkey, who was also using Babylonian star records in the 6th century BCE to predict eclipses, and today, this person is often known as the father of science. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Thales of Miletus. And what did he do that was so different? Thales disentangled logos from mythos. The physical world of order from the traditional world of complex stories 
to explain the operations of nature, which freed philosophers to ask questions about nature instead of assuming they already knew it all from the traditions. So Thales made it his policy to look for natural causes to explain natural phenomena like earthquakes and uh, static electricity. He wondered about the origin and constitution of matter. What's the sun made of? And it wasn't good enough just to say Apollo. What's lightning made of? And it wasn't good enough just to say it's the weapon of Zeus. Our terms physics and, and physical stem from Thales hypothesizing about physis or physica, which referred to natural things that grow as opposed to the artifice of humans. Thales' Greek and Ionian followers noted the periodicity of the motions of the heavenly bodies, and they came to think of the universe in terms of cosmos, meaning order. In contrast with those who passed on complex myths, they sought the fewest number of explanations for a phenomenon, and they built on the discoveries of other observers who used the same approach. And uh, finally, this way, humans began to learn about the cosmos and our place in it, and this is when science started taking off but perhaps not in full force yet, because uh, it wasn't easy being a scientist in those days. And during those centuries following, these guys suffered violent deaths, or their lives were in danger, or they were banished, accused of impiety, Anaxagoras, Cadinu, Aristarchus, Hipparchus. Ptolemy, in the second century, CE, didn't make any waves, didn't suffer, and it was, it was his book, Almagest, which kept the earth in the center, and that was followed almost like a religious text for the next 1,500 years. Which brings us to Copernicus. We often think of uh, him as being uh, this timid scientist, but he was actually involved in a lot of swashbuckling type fighting. He led the defense of the walls of the Allenstein Castle when the Teutonic Knights attacked in 1521. And way back in 1507, he actually wrote and circulated a short, comment short commentary showing that the T Ptolemaic system was wrong. The, this, uh, and, uh, and then, then eventually, of course, as he did publish his heliocentric work, Revolutions, uh, at his death. It took Kepler, who was chased out of several countries, to get the biggest kinks out of the system by showing that Copernicus' circular orbit should actually be ellipses and to discover the laws of planetary motion, and Galileo to show that this new system really was correct by his observations through a telescope. Jupiter had moons, and more importantly, Venus went through all the phases of a moon, from crescent to full. And Newton developed the law of universal gravitation, but he wondered, based on my law of universal gravitation, I wonder why all these bodies don't fall together into a central mass. In the 1920s, Edwin Hubble stumbled upon the answer while using the largest telescope of his day. And this is one of the many places where that crap load of money comes in. Big telescopes are expensive. But you probably know he, he found that our universe doesn't fall back together because it's in an expanding mode. What you might not know is that Hubble's discovery was only possible because just a few years before, someone had found a way to measure the distances to the stars. A worker examining photographic plates of stars at the Harvard College Observatory, Henrietta Leavitt, discovered how a particular kind of star called a Cepheid variable can be used as a standard candle, as a benchmark to judge distances. Normally, the problem using a star's brightness to determine its distance is that you can't tell if a star is bright because it's big or because it's close. Leave it found a particular kind of star that varies in its luminosity according to how fast it's pulsing. But the longer the period of time between peak brightness, the brighter the Cepheid variable star. And thus, she showed astronomers how to use this star to determine its actual brightness, its absolute mag magnitude, and then use the inverse square law to calculate the distance from us. Hubble found a Cepheid variable star in the Andromeda galaxy and found the distance was so great compared to other stars that this had to be far beyond the stars of our Milky Way galaxy. And that Andromeda must be a galaxy in its own right. And that all these cloudy nebulas were galaxies containing their own stars, making our Milky Way just one of many galaxies. And he searched for and he found Cepheid variables in a number of other galaxies to help him measure distances. And he found that except for Andromeda and the nearby Magellanic clouds, all the galaxies were redshifted. Now, redshifting and blue shifting in stars was already understood as a Doppler shift of light, meaning it's, it's shortening the wavelength um, when it's, bl when it's uh, blue because it's, uh, it's moving toward us, um, and red meaning it's being stretched out because it's moving away from us. So all the galaxies are, are moving away from us at tremendous velocities, and the universe is expanding. If you go back in time, 
with this expanding universe, you find it can't keep expanding forever, but it might meet together, which Einstein's general relativity actually predicted, though the idea of a beginning for our universe was not popular at the time, not even with Einstein. Now, at the start of this talk, I was able to give you that timeline of events leading to our present uh, universe and to life and to consciousness on Earth because of discoveries made at each point along the way, most of them just in very recent times. So recent that I, as a science journalist, have interviewed most of the people who made those discoveries who I'm about to mention. Uh, we learned that our universe was actually crammed into this small point because of the accidental discovery in 1965 of the microwave background radiation by Arnold Penzias and Robert Wilson, who accidentally won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. In the 1990s, NASA's John Mather and Berkeley's George Smoot used the Cosmic Background Explorer, the COBE satellite, to confirm the predicted black body characteristics of the cosmic background and its ripples, showing that the source really was everything when it was once condensed to a point. Caltech's Alan Guth solved the problem of explaining how the universe turned out to be so smooth and homogeneous and in the same temperature in all directions by showing how the universe sped up exponentially for a short time, called inflation, the very beginning. Then there was the discovery of uh, extraterrestrial intelligence on Eridani B, 20.71 million uh, light years away. Uh, um, I just wanted to see if you're still paying attention. That discovery is still to come. Now, while, while scientists over the last several hundred years were making all these astronomical and cosmological discoveries, geologists and paleontologists were uh, making discoveries of the evolution of life on Earth, filling in more of that timeline I gave you at the beginning. We know, we know about what fossils are to begin with because of the breakthroughs made first, especially by Danish physician Nicholas Steno, who studied fossils in the 17th century, and most people still thought that fossil seashells grew in the rocks and minerals mated below. But Steno showed instead that the rock, which was once thought of, was, was uh, once in the form of muddy sediment, had actually solidified around the shells. And those shells that looked unlike today's shells and animals were real animals that had once inhabited the seas a long time ago. And he showed how rock became rock. He was able to reproduce this idea of powders and, and dissolving in water and then drying into solids and showing the process of sedimentation. Then he learned how to interpret the way all the sedimentary strata are laid down with lower strata being laid down first and therefore being older. But when Steno worked, he said he always had this goal, quote, given an object possessing a certain form and produced by natural means to find in the object itself evidence showing the position and manner of its production. So there are two things that made the way he went about solving problems scientific in a, science, in a modern sense, and both of these things have been proved most useful for getting at the truth about natural phenomena over the years. The first was the assumption that this object was produced by natural means, an assumption went back to Thales. And the second was to start not with some thesis or cleverly reasoned logical argument, but to start by looking for evidence in the natural object itself. It took two generations after that for people to start paying attention to what Steno said about geology, but once they did, the real heroes were people who went after the data. In this case, the amassing of knowledge of flora and fauna and their fossils from locales all around the world. And that, in turn, required a small army of naturalists who went hunting for that knowledge and those fossils, and that required a motivating force, something that drove certain young people, mainly, to make a name for themselves while finding adventure in faraway places. As Mark Twain put it, to be the first to do something, to say something, see something before anybody else. The pursuit of adventure turns out to be a much more productive motivating force for science than proving an agenda. It might be stretching the point, but you might say that the methodology of science is the spirit of adventure. I think no one has ever put that motivating force into words better than Twain. What is it, he says, that confers the noblest delight? Discovery. To know that you are walking where none others have walked, that you are beholding what human eye has not seen before, that you are breathing a virgin atmosphere. And this is what drove Roy Chapman Andrews, the prototype for Indiana Jones, and dinosaur hunters John Bell Hatcher and Cope and Marsh and so many others to start filling in that fossil record. It's what kept Alfred Russell Wallace coming back to the field after his collected specimens went down with his ship, and another time when they were devoured by ant swarms. And it's what finally focused the unfocused young Darwin so that he seized the chance for a round-the-trip voyage, round-the-world voyage over his father's objections. 
and the reward in each case was a filling in of missing pieces to life's puzzle. Another early worker who helped pave the way for the science of paleontology was the she who sold seashells by the seashore, named Mary Anning, who lived in England from 1799 to 1847. The gentleman naturalists of her day freely made use of her fossil discoveries and her painstaking fossil cleaning and preparation and even used her drawings in their presentations and in their papers, but most gave her no credit. So what's her story? Mary Anning grew up near the cliffs of uh, England's southern coast, today known as the Jurassic Coast, in a family that was desperately poor. Her father took the family out to collect fossils, or curios, as they were called, to sell to seaside visitors in order to supplement his small income as a cabinet maker. Most of what they found were ammonite fossils, ribbed spiral shells of uh, a group of extinct mollusks, valued for their supposed magical powers to cure impotence and barrenness. Mary and her father often had to climb their way out along the steep cliffs to dig half-exposed fossils out of the cliff uh, and out of the base, and sometimes they had to climb up higher when the tide was coming up and uh, before the waves would wash them away. And once her father was badly injured when he lost his footing and he fell, and in 1810, when Mary was just 11, and her father was still mostly incapacitated and weakened by these injuries, he died of tuberculosis, leaving the family deep in debt. So Mary increased her collecting to help support the family, eventually selling enough fossils to purchase her own fossil shop. And she went out daily searching along the cliffs and sometimes climbed them to find large animals like the 17-foot-long skeleton of an ichthyosaur she found shortly after her father's death. The bluffs became unstable in winter when the rains brought frequent landslides, but that was the best time to find newly revealed fossils as they were eroding out. In 1833, she was nearly killed when an overhanging cliff collapsed on her, um, which did kill and bury her constant collecting companion, her black and white terrier, Trey. But her, her finds included some that not only confirmed the extinction of a whole world of different species, but blurred the lines between higher taxa. She was instrumental in changing Richard Owen's mind about the fixity of species and help him prepare the way for people's acceptance of Darwin's theory. She found what looked like intermediates between ancient sharks and rays, and she found ple uh, plesiosaurs and many different kinds of extinct marine reptiles, as well as discovering the flying reptiles, the pterosaurs, meaning winged lizards. What's that kid's joke about pterosaurs? Why do pterosaurs go to the bathroom so quietly? Because they have a silent pee. Now, Anning had no education other than learning how to read at a congregation at Sunday school, but she uh, studied and she read all these scientific papers she could get her hands on, and she taught herself about the anatomy of extinct animals she found by dissecting modern sea animals. And soon she was corresponding with most of the fossil experts of her day who came to rely on her for knowledge of extinct animals from the Jurassic Seas. The Geological Society of London excluded women, the patriarchal culture of Georgian England being even more sexist than classist, which is saying something. And it wasn't until the Gentlemen's Club learned of her impending death from cancer that they made her an honorary member. One geologist who did give her early credit was William Buckland, after Anning shared with him what she had learned about the mysteriously shaped no fossils known as bezoar stones. When she cracked them open, she found skeletons of fish inside, and she'd often spot um, the, the stones in the abdominal areas of the, of the ichthyosaur skeletons, and so she concluded that they represented their feces, and that one could learn about these extinct animals' feeding habits from them. Buckland named them coprolites, from Greek kopros, meaning dung, and lithos, meaning stone, the name by which all fossilized feces have since been known, and credited her when he published her conclusion. Again, some people today uh, know that that Tongue twister, she sells seashells by the seashore was inspired by Anning's work. Fewer know the crucial part she played in convincing the scientists of her day that there had been, in Cuvier's words, an age of reptiles, in which reptiles flew and swam, ruling not only the land, but the air and the sea as well. So as late as the 1820s, um, some naturalists still thought that extinction was impossible, assuming that it would be imply imperfection of God's creation. But her discoveries helped put the final nails in the coffin of the premise that species were eternal. Her work on the food chain of uh, Jurassic times inspired the first paleo art, famous illustrations of pterosaurs diving from the sky and large marine reptiles eating smaller ones in the sea. 
So Anning pursued not only the animal's anatomy, but their story. And by taking the pickaxe to those lumpy fossils, Anning, we can say, found some cool shit. Resulting in the study of ancient ecosystems and helping to found the science of paleontology. Speaking of the Jurassic, I don't have time to tell you of the 25 or so modern scientists I've interviewed uh, who filled in the rest of the story of the age of the reptiles, the Mesozoic, um, and how just in the last 10 years or so, they've figured out why just once in our planet's history, a large, uh, a land animal grew to the size of a house with the ability to peep into seven story windows, the sauropod dinosaurs of the Cretaceous. One hint as to how this happened, the evolution of their hollow bones is one of a unique suite of uh, characteristics that allowed for that one time in our planet's history for an animal to get that big on land. And I don't have time to tell you uh, what we know about hominid evolution, except to tell you that it involves the stories of people still very much alive, which I think I verified when I interviewed them. Richard Leakey, who with Kamoya Kimu, discovered Turkana boy, the most complete specimen of a Homo erectus, standing about 5'4", from about one and a half million years ago. And speaking of Kamoya Kamu, he discovered the earliest Homo sapiens skull at the time, in rocks dated to 195,000 years ago. Meave Leakey, who found the hominid knee that demonstrates an ape-like creature was walking 4.1 million years ago, and who I could hardly keep up with while she was zipping up and down hills like a mountain goat in 110 degree heat, six days a week and whose team found a whole string of specimens showing how Australopithecus anamensis gradually evolved into Australopithecus afarensis between 4.2 and 3 million years ago. And uh, sometimes you can't tell where one ends and the other begins because that evolution happens so gradually. And speaking of afarensis, Donald Johansson discovered Lucy, of course, the most complete Australopithecine, and there's Tim White, Richard Potts, Richard Klein, many others helped fill in the pieces to give us our present knowledge of early human evolution. But last on that list, let me just mention Eric Trinkos, perhaps the world's most prominent Neanderthal expert, because he claimed to show that Neanderthals must have interbred with modern humans, even before the Max Planck Institute gave us the DNA evidence to prove that he was right. But this is also worth a mention in order to, uh, to, ex to uh, uh, because in order to excavate that evidence, that team repeatedly went on one of the most heart-thumping expeditions, the most heart-thumping expedition I've ever had the pleasure of joining, to the world's most inaccessible fossil site, requiring a triathlon of swimming and cave diving and climbing, an hour's journey into the caves, hour's journey back out. But I did one time, these guys did every day all the three months of the field season, below the Carpathian Mountains in Romania. They, swim in, they go swimming into the river that flows into the mountain, then cave diving through a narrow tunnel uh, below the water level, eventually coming up to a space where they then climb up a long chimney to near the top of the mountain, where then that's the place where you reach Pashtura Ku Waze, the gallery with the partially fossilized bones of two 40,000-year-old individuals, earliest modern humans in Europe, who had Neanderthal traits, or archaic traits, mixed with anatomically modern human traits. But let me close with the story of one woman who made the seminal discovery that set off one of those scientific revolutions you hear about, a paradigm shift in geology that literally changed what we now understand of our world's, our planet's evolution. But once again, she doesn't get enough credit for it. Too few have even heard of her. So let's look into what she did, including the big egos and the romances and the conflicts in this very human story. The background to this story is that back in the 1910s, an Arctic explorer named Alfred Wegener put together a lot of pieces to, of evidence to show how the Americas were once joined together with Europe and Africa, not only showing that they fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, which others had done, but showing that the continental margins actually below that made them fit even better, and showing the way the fossils match across the Atlantic, as well as showing distinctive mountain chains that matched the veins of ore that ran across this great divide. And so he proposed continental drift. Geologists worldwide mocked Wegener and marked his model as a crackpot idea. Everyone knew that the Earth's ocean crust was too solid to allow lighter continental crust to go ramming through it. So what was it in the 1950s and 60s that finally convinced scientists that the Americas and Europe and Africa were once attached? That whole continents actually move around the planet. Marie Tharp came to New York in 1948 looking for something exciting to do in science. She came armed with a master's degree in geology and she had earned another degree in mathematics while working for an oil company before that. She went first to the American Museum of Natural History and watched paleontologists slowly, slowly scraping away fossils 
um, from their matrix and decided that looked too tedious. But she found out that the oceanographer, Maurice Ewing, was hiring while he was putting together a new lab called the Lamont Geological Observatory. And so she thought, the ocean, that's Earth's last frontier. There's got to be a lot to discover there. Sign me up. So Doc Ewing, as everyone called their boss, wouldn't give her a position as a scientist, but he hired her as an overqualified drafter to map the ocean floor, along with a young undergrad geology student named Bruce Heason. Though Doc Ewing had hired her as a drafter, the students soon found that they could bring all their data to her when they needed help to interpret them. Bruce Heason thought he uh, sought her out the most for help, and soon they found themselves working together, and she was working on his projects most of the time, in fact, almost exclusively pretty soon. So Tharp, who was four years older than Bruce, became um, Heason's full-time research assistant. Throughout the 1950s, 60s, and much of the 70s, Heason collected seafloor data uh, on the lab's three-masted observatory called the VEMA, where women were excluded, while Tharp drew up the first large-scale topographical ocean floor maps. Doc Ewing didn't allow women aboard because he said women brought bad luck at sea. Heason ran the equipment on the research vessels that towed an echo sounder behind them. In the early days, they actually just threw sticks of dynamite into the ocean and uh, then recorded the time that took the sound waves to bounce off the sea bottom and return back up to the ship. A stylus on the ship scribbled up and down to record the uh, surface features two miles pl plus below, marking it along with huge rolls of paper. So Tharp's job was to slowly unroll those spools of paper, sometimes thousands of feet long, plot the sounding numbers according to their latitude longitude coordinates, and create two-dimensional silhouetted uh, side views of the ocean floor called profiles. So much for avoiding tedium. Doc Ewing, it turned out, was a hothead with a large but delicate ego. People described Heason in similar terms, and the Lamont building wasn't big enough for the two of them. When they had words inside, those words could be heard outside and recorded seismographically. Doc Ewing suspected everyone of being out to steal his scientific ideas. And Heason was given to tantrums. He uh, kicked walls and hurled waste baskets across the room when having a bad day. And uh, he had lots of bad days. Their blow-ups were mainly over the fact that Heason was too independent, wouldn't support his boss's theories of an unchanging planet, which were, uh, these ideas were indeed wrong. And Heason instead favored a theory of how the Earth was rapidly expanding, which was equally wrong. Doc Ewing expected the scientists of his lab to follow his lead as a fixist, no expansion, no contraction for the Earth, and contraction was the, the doctrine most geologists have been taught for decades before that, and certainly no continental drift. Heason accused Doc Ewing of censoring his papers and violating his academic freedom, and by the 1960s, Doc Ewing repeatedly tried to fire Heason, but he couldn't find a way around the tenure rules because by that time, Heason had achieved a permanent professorship at Columbia University, which ran the lab. So Ewing cut off Heason's funding and denied him access to the lab's data, and he fired his assistant, Marie Tharp. Heason found more grant money and data elsewhere and rehired Harp, Tharp to continue working on the maps from her home. Now, it wasn't just Heason and Doc Ewing who would yell at each other. In the course of a typical working day, Heason would yell at Tharp, too, and she would often yell right back. But they got along. I mean, they really got along. Um, uh, and so their colleagues weren't sure what to make of all the time they spent together, not only at work, but where they argued, but dining out, getting drinks out together, and no one, no one was quite sure how far their passion extended beyond their passion for maps. Maybe they were just really good friends. But I will note that when Heason died in a submarine a few years later, he left his money and his house to Marie. In any case, Marie Tharp made her initial discovery in the fall of 1952, and she collected all the depth measurements she could, she could find from the ship's data for the past 30 years. And working over her drafting table, she put together the depths of along the ship's courses to create six parallel east-west topographical profiles across the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic's dark unknown, six ribbons of light, as she called them, alone, she profiled, um, each profile showed a jagged outline of uh, 3,000 miles of seafloor, lacking any obvious pattern. And just to be able to put those together was a feat because all the ships would meet in Bermuda and then go out from there, and so they were just all over the place as they were moving around, and she had to try to make them straight to figure out where they had been. But some combination of Tharp's geological knowledge intuition and patience allowed her to make sense of the jumble of tens of thousands of sounding numbers, even while others looked at the same data and saw nothing. 
But after studying these profiles and rearranging them for six weeks, the shape of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge became somewhat clear, running from north to south through these profiles, and there seemed to be no end to it. But the most bizarre thing was that she noticed right in the middle of this mountain range underwater, where she expected to find a peak, was a vertex instead. Where she expected to see a summit, she found a valley running all the way down this long mountain range. To her, it looked like a rift valley where land had sunken between two parallel faults. What was a rift valley doing on top of a mountain chain? It reminded her of the East African rift system, you know, where, uh, which splits Saudi Arabia from Africa and goes down 4,000 miles from there. When she showed the valley to Hezen and explained its possible significance to, to be a, a continent splitter, he doubted the existence of a valley running along the ridge and he dismissed her ideas as girl talk. It fit no geological causes he knew, can't be, he said. It looks too much like continental drift. So he ordered her to replot the data from scratch to see where she had gone wrong. Tharp complied. She later wrote, but I thought the rift valley was real and I kept looking for it in all the data I could get. If there were such a thing as, a con as continental drift, it seemed logical that something like a mid-ocean rift valley might be involved. The valley would form where new material came up from deep inside the earth, splitting the mid-ocean ridge in two and pushing the sides apart. Unquote. Long story short, she finally convinced Heason when the two of them found that earthquake epicenters ran directly under the valley along that uh, ridge. This, this valley, by the way, is like 40 to 60 miles in width and all along, not just coincident with the mountain range, but actually under the valley is where they found these epicenters, not just under the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but all around the planet, um, like the seams of a baseball, 45,000 miles they had discovered the largest geological feature on Earth. In 1957, Ewing had Columbia University's news office issue a press release, and the next day, the New York Times announced Fisher circling globe and included a photo of Doc Ewing and a description of his work with Heason, no mention of Tharp. In 1963, two, two Cambridge geologists predicted that if the seafloor was moving from each side of this mid-ocean bridge, um, Researchers should find matching magnetic stripes on either side. They knew that the Earth's magnetic polarity had repeatedly reversed over geological time, so if the seafloor was moving, it should show, leave a record of those reversals on each side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, from 1963 to 1968, airborne and ship drag magnetometers confirmed that the ocean, oceans actually did bear these long, alternating north-south magnetic stripes, with short stripes on the one side mirrored by short stripes on the other side. Then Princeton geologist Harry Hess developed his conveyor belt hypothesis, proposing that the new seafloor spreads out from the mid-ocean ridge, travels east and west till it finally reaches the continental margins on each side where it's pulled down into the trenches and then comes down and goes around again. It's going around as a cycle. So all at once, most of the Earth's volcanic and seismic activity was explained by these two actions, creation of new crust and then destruction of the old. This idea had tremendous explanatory power, explaining why the ocean crust is found to be youngest and warmest and thinnest along the mid-ocean ridges in the centers, where it originates as magma, and why it becomes progressively cooler, older, and thicker, thickening as it cools as it nears the continental margins. By 1967, researchers realized that the Earth's crust was divided into at least six major plates with many minor ones, and soon scientists were creating a picture of the changing positions of the continents over geological history. It wasn't until almost 50 years later, after her discovery of mid-ocean ridges in 1999, that other oceanic uh, institutions began recognizing Tharp for her contributions for helping to in the development of plate tectonics. Now, one result of all of this, this crust recycling, and it is, is stability in terms of large land masses that stay above sea level, as I mentioned before, uh, for ages, counteracting their erosion. Continental crust is replenished by orogeny, mountain building. Most mountains are built by folding, faulting, and buckling, all caused by plates, these moving plates. Without plate tectonics, the earth would flatten out. No continents. We'd be back to the a water world where we started over a billion years ago. From our viewpoint, plate tectonics does have its disadvantages. We humans get blasted by earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanoes. The advantage, human existence. 
Scientists searching for extraterrestrial life would like to find planets that can do what Earth does in terms of recycling, the recycling of carbon through volcanic outgassing and then subduction back into the mantle is critical to carbon-based life. And I mentioned how Earth's uh, geological carbon cycle is among the, the key factors serving as a global thermostat, avoiding a snowball Earth through excess volcanic uh, outgassing or a runaway greenhouse through excess chemical weathering, a thermostat obviously lacking on Venus and Mars. But the facts also include bad news for everybody. Earth's atmosphere is composed of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.93% argon, and just 0.04% carbon dioxide. Earth's surface temperatures are acutely sensitive to even the slightest changes in the amount of carbon dioxide, the most important greenhouse gas for controlling Earth's climate. Our industrial civilization's relatively recent dumping of extra carbon dioxide into Earth's atmosphere threatens to unbalance our carbon cycle. Natural geology, uh, natural geological activity like volcanoes expels about, only about 1% of the carbon dioxide that humans now expel. All the extra carbon dioxide needs to go somewhere. Measurements show that while oceans and land plants are now absorbing 55% of this excess carbon dioxide, 45% of it stays and accumulates in the atmosphere. The excess carbon dissolving in the oceans increases its acidity already by 30% since the industrial age began, threatening marine life. When a greenhouse gas continually increases in the atmosphere faster than it can be trapped back into the mantle, a net positive feedback occurs. This is not positive for life. No one knows exactly how much carbon dioxide will result in a tipping point when Earth's natural carbon sink won't be able to keep up with the atmosphere's extra carbon dioxide. Could this result in an actual runaway greenhouse effect in which our oceans would actually boil away? A few think this is possible for Earth, but most scientists who study the question do not. All do agree that Earth won't have to experience a runaway greenhouse before experiencing lethal conditions for most of our planet's species. This is already seriously bad news for everybody. We know that nature's recycling powers have not prevented our Earth from experiencing five extinction events. Today, we are in the midst of Earth's sixth mass extinction, the only one to be caused by humans who have hit the planet with at least three extinction-causing factors at once, the acidification of the oceans, to say nothing is overfishing, deforestation and the annihilation of habitats, and the pumping of uh, additional carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which exacerbates the other two. Since 1990, 468 vertebrates have gone extinct. If we don't take co corrective measures Biologists estimate that between 30 and 50% of all species could face extinction by the end of this century. This devastation of biodiversity threatens to upset natural processes we humans depend on, of course, the food chain, pollination, and water purification. And just at the time when we need to be increasing our understanding of the situation regarding climate change, the U.S. government's administration has proposed terminating the carbon monitoring system as well as NASA's PACE mission, Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem mission, the Orbiting Carbon mission, and the Deep Space Climate Observatory. And while the military budget is being increased, our president is proposing budget cuts to the U.S. Geological Survey and a 37% cut to the National Oceana Oceana Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's research, and a 40% cut to the Environmental Protection Agency. As far as astronomy and astrophysics are concerned, every decade since the 1960s, the Congress has approved the highest priority mission of the astronomical community uh, until this decade. Our next generation telescope after the James Webb Telescope, which is about to be launched next year, I believe, is the WFIRST, the first wide field, uh, the wide field infrared survey telescope designed to hunt for exoplanets and help us understand dark matter. That mission is being canceled. At the annual AAAS science meeting in February, climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe gave a talk called When Facts Aren't Enough. She said, we have a situation now where the fear of solutions is greater than the fear of impacts. And she spoke of exactly what people fear. They're afraid of scientists or liberals or outsiders telling them what to do. A study of 300 Americans last year in the European Journal of Social Psychology revealed fear as an overwhelming motivating factor for decision-making among political conservatives compared to political liberals, which makes conservatives ripe pickings for fear mongers who use people's fears to get them to vote for them and often against their own interests. So what can we do? 
Let's be the opposite of fear mongers. Let's befriend people who are fearful of science and show them firsthand that we don't want to take away anything from them. We want to take away their rights. We actually want them to prosper and all our children and grandchildren to thrive. Of the many millions of species that have inhabited our planet, none does a better job of cooperating with one another than Homo sapiens, but only within the tribe. We fear outsiders, and politicians on both sides appeal to people's fear of the other. So let's not be outsiders, let's be and make friends. We're all insiders together, sharing this planet inside the same protecting ozone layer and magnetosphere. Let them know we're on their side. We want what they want. Let's be patient educators. Let's be good listeners to them so they know we understand their fears about vaccinations, about climate change, about evolution, um, GMOs. Let's work together to alleviate the fears. Science has a long history now of getting people to work together, often across national boundaries, sometimes even when those nations are at war. If only humans could attack scientific problems instead of each other. Science requires great aggressiveness in action to get things done, to tackle problems. If we humans have to be warlike, there may be few more productive ways to challenge our warlike passions than into science. But if we sit by passively and do nothing, that may be the cruelest thing we can do to one another. Short term, certainly, there is a lot to fear, to be pessimistic about. I've just talked about for the last couple of minutes with the, the cutting of the science programs and the carbon emissions uh, problem and our ushering in the sixth mass extinction. It would seem we're on a, a backward trajectory. But let me end with this thought about the long term, because the long term th trajectory we're on gives us reason to think that we can make a difference. And we're on a spectacularly constructive trajectory. And this is true whether we look at the progress of the human race and the development of science from Thales to where science is today, or look at what science has revealed about the grand trajectory of nature and this timeline we've been looking at, about the rather constructive trajectory of the whole universe and our planet appeared to be on in terms of going in a productive, productive direction from our human viewpoint, from hydrogen to humans. And we're reminded of Tennyson's line, I, the heir of all things, of all ages, in the foremost files of time. We are heir to all that preceded us. And understanding all that preceded us can help us not just predict the future, but change the future. It's a great day for the race. Thanks for your kind attention. And I'll be glad. Yeah, I'll be glad to take some questions if anyone has some. Yeah, ideas about it existing as a problem or how to solve it. Hmm. Actually, um, I, my expertise is more in on evolution. Um, than it is on the climate thing is something I've actually just become aware of as I've become woke in the recent last just couple of years. So um, I was with Meeve Leakey, when I mentioned Meeve Leakey, and I remember um, at Turkana, we were driving along and came to a place where she just out of the blue asked, where do you stand on climate change? This is way back in 2007. I wasn't sure what I thought about anything back then, but then she relayed some stories to me about how when she had visited um, the United States and had gone to various colleges. She included on that tour some Christian colleges. And when she went to the Christian colleges, um, there was there was sometimes in their, their Q and A, a, a girl would stand up. She gave one example of a girl who stood up and said, "But you know, we really believe that that the Lord is coming back, and so why do we need to worry about the future?" And um, so she was obviously. Um, that, that's just a memory that comes to my mind about what started me thinking in 2007 about uh, maybe I, as a Christian, uh, should not be listening to my Christian brothers on that one, among a number of other things, actually. But yeah, specifically about plastics, bad. <laughs> that's all I know. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Uh, as a Christian, what is your Christian cosmology 
and how does it fit in or not fit in with the scientific story of the universe's origin and unfolding? Um, I hope you got the impression, because I was hoping to make it pretty clear what I, where I'm at in terms of uh, an understanding of the importance. We're looking at those three examples from the ancient past that we don't want to get our science, including our cosmology, from our ancient texts. We today can look back and, and laugh at the ancient texts of the people of what they had back then, and an atheist today can laugh at my ancient text, of course, for the same reasons. Um, I laugh at it too when it comes to any understanding that the ancient people who were writing uh, the Bible had of uh, cosmology. They didn't have any knowledge of cosmology. So in what's called biblical hermeneutics and interpretation of Bible scriptures, um, it's important not to um, take a position that many evangelicals do called concordism, where you're trying to always make it fit the science. Rather, I think it's more honest to say they didn't have science yet. They didn't have any, there was no modern science and the ancient Hebrews weren't aware of those things. Um, the one thing I will say on their behalf though is that they, they weren't looking at the stars and saying they were gods and they were looking at them only as timekeepers rather than as something to be used to uh, give them uh, knowledge about the God's will for, for the plant, for our earth. So um, cosmology, I like anything else, I look at uh, the Big Bang as I take it for everything that it tells us about and I go to science to learn about cosmology. And I go to, I don't look to science for finding meaning. There I would look to, to Jesus and I don't look to science to learn about love. There I would look to Jesus. Um, I don't go to Jesus to learn about the Big Bang. That answer your question? No. Sorry. <laughs> I can do better if you be more specific about cosmology as far as what I think as a Christian about cosmology. Well, I guess in terms of like your literal belief about the Christian story, how much of it do you consider to be true? And, and if not, then how do, how do you consider yourself a Christian? Sure. Um, the, there was a belief in ancient times of a three-tiered universe, and you can see that reflected in sometimes in some of the writings in the Bible. So that background knowledge to me um, was wrong. Everyone held it, including if you believe in inspiration, the inspired writers, I might have a different view of exactly what inspiration consists of. Um, but I believe that uh, if there is a God and God wanted to communicate to us something about who he is, if he chose to do it through um, introducing us, and by the way, I don't worship the Bible, I worship Jesus. So that kind of differentiates me from many of my evangelical brethren. They seem to find the Bible, you know, it has to be inerrant and it's holy. And, and I don't think it's holy. I think it's um, written by humans, and uh, God has used it, um, but I believe that the real revelation of God is Jesus. Do you believe in the, the resurrection? Yeah, with all that coming up recently, I was reading a lot of stuff about that again, of course, with uh, Easter time, and uh, um, I, I have more questions than answers about a lot of things. Um, I don't serve God because I'm expecting or that I, I know that what my future is going to be and whether there's going to be a future. I serve God, sort of the way C.S. Lewis talked about uh, uh, one of the ancients serving Odin because he was on Odin's side. I, I haven't found anybody who I, whose words my heart resonates with more than Jesus in terms of his teachings about forgiveness and peacemaking and, and loving not only your enemies but loving your neighbor. So I, I'm a Jesus follower. Um, I, uh, I don't know what to believe about the hereafter. I'll let that take care of itself. So that's an I don't know. That's an I don't know. Yeah. To be a Christian, you follow Christ, it doesn't necessarily mean you declare yourself to know everything about cosmology or the future. Um, I have a quick question, just shifting gears a little bit. Um, the scientists that you have intervie interviewed, um, which did you find the most interesting? Um, uh, one comes to mind offhand, uh, young, really young guys, younger than I am, and this was back when I was kind of on the young side. Uh, Chuck Steidel was the guy who um, at Caltech discovered baby galaxies. And this is when the hubs were the only thing that was lit up. And it was one of the first visual representations that we had of an older universe. We already knew that there were lots of quasars in the older universe, but this was exciting to see stellar, actually galactic evolution, that the galaxies weren't always there. 
and they were they actually grew up as infants. So it was, that was one cool memory of how he um, used the the um, biggest telescope. Once again, money is required here of uh, the planet at that time on Mauna Kea, Hawaii, to be able to get observing time to do that. Anything else? Yes. Uh, hey, hi. Hey, I really love your lecture. It was extremely cool. Um, as I, uh, my question is related with previous questions. So uh, you, as a Christian, how do you interact or try to send this message of science and reason to people that it's not as open-minded as you? That's the first question. And the other one is, are you doing something like actively in Christian communities to try to convey this message of reason? Yeah, well, I'm a big believer that the pen is mightier than the sword, and so I'm using my pen or my little computer every day for the last uh, several decades to, to write. Um, and I've actually got four books going simultaneously right now because I think the best way to reach my uh, fellow Christians, to let them know some of the things we talked about today, one of those ideas comes from a book I'm working on, one of the ideas we shared today about uh, these three ancient civilizations. I love Christians to be able to get the idea that you can't get your science from the ancient texts that you were asking about, and they can see how silly it was for the people to do it back then, and they should be able to see how silly it is to try to do that uh, today. So I, I want to be able to just do a good job with the other book I'm working on about evolution to show why they should accept evolution as in, if you're a Christian, you believe that however we got here, God did it, then God used evolution to create us. That would be something, that, once again, Meve Leakey brought up to me that uh, she thinks this kind of uh, young earth creationism idea, this idea of nothing really being real because it never really had a buildup to it, it just suddenly, poof, it's there, uh, would be kind of a, a, not a very creative way to create as she puts it, and how much more, how does she put it, how much more imaginative and creative to have creation be something you can watch blossom and, and, and uh, grow the way evolution does, adapt. Much more exciting and interesting to, uh, to have creation happen that way. I would just like to piggyback on uh, this last question as well. Uh, assuming that we go out and we address some of these issues with um, logic, with science, with fact and evidence, knowing the world um, doesn't all revolve around those issues like um, I think I would prefer that they do. Um, what is the Christian kryptonite that we're missing? What is the Christian what? Kryptonite. Like if we can't beat you down with logic and reason, what, what, what do we have next to go to to try to win back support on things that are like you know, life-threatening and real? When you're talking to a believer, a Christian believer, or when you're talking to someone else? Well, well, in your case, I think you're converted, so at least to science. But for those who refuse, who are just like, um, you know, that just refuse to acknowledge these facts, then, I mean, what, what, what's the next step? How do we get a message across if they're not willing to listen? Ah, yeah. Um, getting someone to listen who doesn't want to listen is always difficult, if not impossible. But a starting place is certainly to just be their friend, to be able to, you know, I, I, don't, I don't expect with all my, for example, all my atheist friends to be able to convert them. I gave up on that a long time ago. Uh, not completely, but pretty much. Uh, and, and I think I'm called, and I think what Jesus would want me to do, if there is a real man named Jesus who God has used to teach us what he wants us to know, I think I'm, I would be called, if I want to use that term, to... Um, help bring harmony to be between people who are having different beliefs because right now we're not getting things done on the things we should be able to work together on. So maybe I would appeal to a fellow believer on that same basis. Um, I can appeal to my atheist friends uh, much more easily um, regarding things having to do with climate change and so on than I can to my Christian friends because then I have to convert them to science first. Maybe that was your question. How do you convert them to science? Yeah, education and uh, gentle education with patience, listening as you educate. And I think we're about there, huh? That is all the time we had. Uh, thank you very much, Fred. Uh, we are going to take a couple of minutes uh, while our next speaker sets up, and we play with lights. Uh, and then we'll be back with our next speaker, and a big, a big hand for Fred Heron. <laughs>